and our musicians into the future. It is precisely against this background that uh, we have brought together people from diverse walks of life today to dialogue on the current state of our world with a view of developing an understanding and increased awareness of specific leadership issues facing our organizations and presenting potential solutions to identify the issues. In doing so, we have two dynamic women, uh, Dr. Laura Kiros and Dr. Matilda Isaac Mustafa. Uh, Dr. Laura Kiros is a professor at Adelphi University and Dr. Isaac Mustafa is a professor at Madonna University in Michigan. These women are both scholars and business consultants and they have been involved in helping to develop the leaders that our current world needs. Uh, the first person that will speak today uh, will be Dr. Isaac Mustafa, who will give us a presentation on neurotic leadership. And we cannot deny uh, that we have been seeing much of that in our world today and in our organizations. Uh, so I will uh, introduce Dr. Isaac Mustafa, and she will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A. And then after that, uh, Dr. Kiros will uh, come on deck and we'll also have a Q&A uh, session. And then we will all together have a discussion uh, before we call it a day. Uh, so as I have indicated, everybody is muted right now. But you can uh, use uh, the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen if you have a question uh, for the speaker. Uh, they can all read, they can both uh, read the questions and, uh, and answer them. If you use the chat uh, feature, I will read whatever is there. Uh, but if you use the Q&A, they will see those questions and they will answer them. Uh, Dr. Mustafa is a quantitative systems management and marketing professor in the School of Business at Madonna University in Michigan. Uh, she brings nine years of corporate experience in quality management to the academic setting. She received her bachelor's degree in science and a master of science degree in business administration, uh, you know, uh, in quality management actually, and her PhD is in technology management. She's also the founder and CEO of Research and Data Integrity Incorporated. Dr. Mustafa focuses on developing research and analytical skills for both graduate and undergraduate students. She has taught a variety of courses ranging from business statistics, international business, strategic management, leadership and ethics, research methodology, computer science, management information systems, and operations management. Dr. Mustafa has also taught business management courses for Madonna University in the international programs at, in Dubai, uh, mainland China, and Haiti. She's also involved in several research projects, including the symbolic interactionist view on transnational education, managing virtual teams, ethical organizational climate, transformational leadership and emotional intelligence and examining the paradoxical relation between socio-technology optimization and Marxist theory of alienation. She has co-authored in highly referenced, she, she has been co uh, she has co-authored uh, various publications uh, in scientific and business journals and health informatics textbooks. She has also presented widely internationally and in the United States and might I add that she's Canadian born, uh, but resides here in the United States. Uh, she is a professional chair member of the International Economics Development and Research Center, and a member of the Decision Sciences Institute, and also a member of the Society for Collegiate Leadership and Achievement Honor, uh, just to name a few. She's also an honorary faculty member of Delta Mu Delta, and a faculty advisor on several academic committees at Madonna University. She is here today in her capacity as an academic and a business consultant. Uh, Dr. Mustafa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Isaac. 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 Thank you
<laughs> Thank you and good morning to everyone. Uh, it's Saturday morning and uh, I really appreciate the fact that um, as many of you that can come out, uh, have come out to uh, hopefully we're here to add to the body of knowledge and to my um, co-panelist and, and the host, uh, Dr. Laura, good to see you on here, and uh, Dr. Nia Selleck. When we uh, talk about uh, neurotic leadership, in order to make the contrast, um, I just I want to touch on briefly on a transformational leadership, just real quick. Um, I don't want to do a lot of talking on that because we've we've done quite a few, and we're probably going to hear some more today. The transformational leadership stands out in leadership, and it stands out because it has a couple of attributes that gives the followers or employees uh, a comfort zone. And so what a comfort zone does is it creates an environment that actually uh, enhances learning, effectivity, autonomy. And it, uh, it's one of the things that uh, most companies who are more interested in the bottom line uh, do not have much affinity for. And so uh, one of the things, uh, let's talk about the um, a quality of the transformational leader. The idea uh, of uh, the idealized influence. And so what they do is they want to see you do well. And so they push for your own prosperity on the job. Because the belief is that once you do well, eventually it's a domino effect, everyone else will do well. And so there are motivators as well. They also do have something called an individualized consideration. And what that means is they have full consideration for your well being. They consider you as well in decision making. They consider you as well in terms of some of your concerns that you may have. Some of us may have heard of our companies where, um, and I've heard this before, where companies would have a tag, each worker would have a tag on their door and you would identify how you're feeling. So if it's a green day, feeling great, I woke up great this morning, you have a green tag. If it's an um, interesting day, you're not really sure what's going on, you have a yellow tag or amber. And then if it's really a bad day, you have red. The reason for this is so that the organization or the leadership can coalesce together and figure out how can they make your day better. Some of us might say this doesn't seem so realistic, but it will surprise you how little things can actually foster uh, a good working environment. Now, they also have a quality of intellectual stimulation. Many of you do know that if you're not intellectually stimulated, it is almost impossible for you to learn. The constructivism view says that the learner must find meaning in what they do. And in order to find meaning in what they do, the environment must be set for them to prosper. And so other researchers are now thinking, what is it about the transformational leader that makes them so great? Some has gone as far as looking at their level of intelligence and not in terms of the abstract learning or aptitude learning, but they're looking at more of their emotional intelligence. And so they see now that the transformational leader is not only self-aware, but they're also aware of others. They self-regulate so they can regulate their emotions well, and also able to regulate the emotions of others that are around them. And so that is very, very key. But let me tell you a type of leadership that will be in full contract with the transformational leader. And so that brings me into the neurotic style of leadership. The neurotic style of leadership really creates an environment that's not conducive for learning or for even productivity. And sometimes some have even fallen victim of this and they've looked at a neurotic style of leadership because there are certain characteristics within that neurotic style that may be appealing for a lot of people who are looking for leaders that are go-getters and pushers. But let's not be deceived. The moronic leadership style has a couple of qualities, a certain type of leadership within that neurotic style. And so the neurotic is more anxious and they're more idiosyncratic. 
And so the forced meaning, the forced coercion, and some have given attributes of an erotic leadership style, which I want to talk about one of them today. They can be um, apprehensive. They can be abrasive. Uh, they can be um, narcissistic, impulsive, implosive, uh, and um, explosive. But let's, let's focus a little bit on the narcissist because this leader may seem attractive to some because like I said, they're the go-getter, but there's a part of this leader that's even been looked at at even the American Psychiatric Association and wondering if this could be a disorder. I'm not the scientist in that field, but I'll let those who are experts in there within the panel, let them talk about that. But there's a couple of things to draw my attention. Uh, they are self-absorbed. There's a level of arrogance that comes with that leader. There's a level of uh, insatiable obsession with wanting to be recognized. There's envy. Uh, oftentimes I hear students or I hear people say, you know, the leader doesn't want me to uh, do well or to prosper. Uh, there's envy. And the narcissist within the neurotic leadership style, um, the gain the, the word from uh, a, a myth, a Greek myth, about a young man who was so impressed by the perception of his own reflection that his reflection was more important to him than anything else. That eventually, he eventually, uh, he killed himself. And because when these leaders are not able to integrate their own idealized views of themselves with their own inadequacies, it becomes a serious problem. So what type of environment does this narcissistic, neurotic leader create? An environment whereby the only type of people that can foster around them are people who somehow have adopted the neurotic style of leadership. Because oftentimes they're very charismatic. And people sometimes would adore the charisma, but the arrogance in which they operate in, it's not the, uh, it's, un it's unhealthy. Because some of you would say, well, you know, uh, overconfidence may be seen as um, arrogant, but you know, um, how do you, um, how do you say that uh, just because someone is arrogant means they're narcissistic? No. When this arrogance gets to a point where it begins to infringe on the rights of others within the company, then it's unyielding arrogance. It's an arrogance that cannot be uh, negotiated. Neither can you even say, well, uh, let's see what we can do to help this person. Because the narcissistic leader or the neurotic leader is overly confident in what they do. They feel infallible. I cannot fail and I cannot flaw because I am flawless. Some have argued that somehow between their childhood and adulthood, there's been a, a problem in the specs. Well, you want the job. It's not my responsibility to try to figure out uh, how the leader was raised, how they were born, um, how to survive that environment. But one thing is very, very clear. When the narcissistic leader operates, the action and the bearings of the leader is to make sure that you, the follower, are not able to stand on your own. So there's often a codependency. So this triage here is, for this narcissistic leader to operate is, first of all, they have to have compliant followers. So you have the narcissistic leader, the compliant followers, and then there has to be an environment for that. So the culture lacks trust, the culture lacks ethics, the culture lacks amicable learning. There is no mutual symbiotic learning process because on a job, everyone in the job must be able to learn and develop. 
And so as you develop within the job, the type of leader that fosters development and growth within the organization is one that actually believes that when you learn and you succeed, that they also can do well. So many researchers have come to terms with the fact that Though some may argue that the narcissistic or the neurotic leader may go ahead and give the company what they need in terms of results. And so those companies are very concerned about the bottom line. However, the point still remains. Under no circumstances can a narcissistic leader breed transformational followers. All they do is create a cycle. And so what companies sometimes fail to understand is when the narcissistic leader leaves, who do you then replace them with? If you replace that leader with your transformational leader, be careful that the narcissistic leader has not created a negative environment where some of the followers themselves have actually become narcissistic in order to survive. And so what you may create is that you may create an anarchy. And that's why the transformational leader is very crucial because they don't just come in and run abrasively or abruptly or just implode. They take their time, they process. They're self-aware about their emotion, they understand the environment that they're in, and that's the only way they do well. I hope I've been able to help you with some information here. Uh, yes, so I, I think I should probably come to you with a, with a first question, and uh, uh, which is, uh, right here, as we say, we have people from around the world. We have people from five countries that are tuned in, that are actually watching us right now. We have people from across the United States, uh, from Canada, mm -hmm. Nigeria, India, and Ghana. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't mention the UK. That would be six countries uh, that are watch that are here right now. Uh, so the question that I have is, does society breed the neurotic leader or does society just nurture someone who is already neurotic that becomes a leader? When we talked about leadership the last time, we talked about how a leader can be uh, trained, made, or born. Society sometimes creates an environment whereby negative reinforcement and people, what I mean by that is that people continue to get rewards for bad behavior. And so what happens here is society itself opens the door because a neurotic leader cannot function in an environment that doesn't foster such behavior. If there are consequences for such actions, oftentimes the neurotic, neurotic leader would have a difficult time. And so this is what they do. When a neurotic leader notices that the environment is not comfortable, they withdraw. But keep in mind that the neurotic leader is very, very intrusive. And what I also mean by that is that it can be very manipulative. And so how can a neurotic leader become manipulative? A neurotic leader becomes manipulated by watching for weaknesses. So when the neurotic leader notices that the environment is not conducive, they don't necessarily leave right away. They sit back and then they watch. The next plan of action is to begin to understand the weaknesses of their followers. So yes, society can only help to foster such leadership because if not, we wouldn't have them. And not only that, we wouldn't have them in such high positions. And most oftentimes, you find them in very, very high crucial positions because there's something about them. Remember as well that they're charismatic. So it is possible that Oftentimes in society, we don't, we're not able to decipher between the charismatic leader and the leader who's overly self-idealized. Right, so uh, is there any question uh, that anybody else has? I don't see any questions, but I did uh, also, I did receive one uh, that was, okay. Uh, Dr. Mustafa, there's a question for you. Can you read it? Uh, you want me to go into the chair, Q&A? Okay, uh, it, it, it says, uh, my question is for Dr. Mustafa. 
can it be argued that certain developmental situations require narcissistic leaders? Uh, can we take their positives? That question is from Canada. Okay. There has been theories and many researchers have looked at this. And one of the, like I said, one of the things that they've looked at in terms of positivity is the fact that they are charismatic and they are go-getters. And I said that earlier. While, you, while a company or an organization may enjoy the fact that this person is a driver, then what you're doing is that you, a, an organization is looking at the good of one at the expense of all the others. And like I said earlier, when that leader leaves, because I have heard this where people have said, well, the narcissistic leader uh, or the neurotic leader is good for, uh, for example, the bottom line, they're good for the drive. But just in case, because if, if your company is for what's pr for, for this exact moment right now, then that's fine. That's what you want to do. That's fine. It, that's how you want to run your organization. But always think about the fact that sustainability is important. So if you keep a leader that's neurotic in your organization and well, while they have uh, um, obliterated the effectiveness of the people that work with you in that organization, when that leader leaves, you don't have a choice. You want to go back and either bring in another neurotic leader and neurotic leader comes in different levels. If you bring a transformational leader in from the beginning, you won't have the problem you will face with a neurotic leader when they exit and even while they're there. So then what happens to your employees that have been driven and been pushed and that the only form of motivation that they have is all those hygiene factors and not the motivational factors. The question now becomes what happens to them? What you've just done is you just demoralized people. You have deactivated uh, their uh, um, mode of operation. You have demoralized yourself. You have brought them to a point whereby when that leader leaves, there is a breakdown because remember, a neurotic and a narcissistic leader must create co-dependency in order for them to succeed. And so when your workers do not have autonomy and all they do is focus on the person that's leading them and they are not autonomous, you run yourself into a problem sooner or later. But there has been no theory that has been able, the jury's still out on this, there's been no theory that has been able to discuss the neurotic leadership style and its negativity and talked about its, posit its positivity, positivity on the followers. Rather, they talk about the bottom line. And this is what we're trying to stay away from. Good question, by the way. Right. Let me say that that question was from the president of uh, Vintage Vantage Advisory, which is a leading financial services firm in Brampton, uh, Ontario, in Canada. Uh, we have a question from Edmonton, Canada. Uh, the question says, uh, thanks for your strong uh, statement. If you have a very strong toxic environment, what can a transformational leader do to turn things around for the better? Very good question. So the transformational leader, and what I like and I enjoy about the transformational leader is the transformational leader needs to have an accurate perception of the situation. A, tra a transformational leader is not only perceptive, but they understand what steps to take. Now, the steps, the steps to take goes into the steps of decision making. Now, there is a heuristic decision making where people skip steps uh, and sometimes you have to, the police officers sometimes have to do that. But there's been, we've also seen the, the, the consequences of that. So the transformational leader comes in and actually does an assessment of the uh, organization, sees what's going on. So one of the first things that the transformational leader needs to do is actually begin to garner support. How to gain support is to be able to let people buy into the vision. The vision and the mission and the goal of the company is very, very, should be very, very clear. Most companies have their mission and vision invested in the people, the employee. Since the narcissistic leader or the neurotic leader is very focused on the bottom line, the transformational leader must come in and begin to allow people to understand that their own feelings and their concerns does matter. And so this is where the idealized consideration of the transformational leader comes in. So that leader is able to look at the situation, do an assessment and do a situation analysis. So each situation is different. I will divide the people into three groups. I will see those that have already been demoralized. I will see those who just followed because they just wanted to follow. 
not because they believed in the same thing. And those that have actually bought into the narcissistic leadership. And so those that have bought into the narcissistic leadership, it might be a little bit difficult, but you're going to have to do a reprogramming like in the military where it's mechanistic and bureaucratic. But people have used that as well and saying, well, in the military, well, in the military, while they break you down, they build you back up. But when the narcissistic leader breaks you down, someone else has to come and build you back up. And the person that doesn't understand the root of the problem would have to do a whole lot of phases of change. And as you know, change can be very difficult, especially for those who are more comfortable with change. So I'm hoping I've been able to help you with that. Yes. Right. There are two questions that I would like to roll into one. Um, the first is, it seems like you're talking about our president here in the United States. So how will the new administration very hopefully change the atmosphere of, the atmosphere of neurotic fear that is now present in our society? The second question uh, says, uh, narcissists always think they are right about everything and they never apologize. So how do you have a constructive dialogue with them? Let me, uh, let me save the politics for the last. Let me go back to the leader that um, is, um, doesn't think that um, they are wrong. What I have learned, in order to dialogue with a narcissistic leader, you yourself from the beginning of time, see, you may not know the narcissist that you're dealing with, but one thing is key, they have to know who you are. The narcissist must understand who you are and what you stand for. It's not done in an aggressive or an abrasive way because that's a threat to the narcissist. You yourself must be a good uh, uh, one who is a great perceptor, must be a great observer of people in their personalities. Not everybody has the skill, but please ask for discernment to be able to discern this. And so while you may not know what they're capable of, because oftentimes they're very manipulative and to have a civil dis discourse with them might be very difficult. But one thing that I have learned and I have known to be true is that when a narcissistic or neurotic leader understands where you stand and your stand is not wavering, what I mean by not wavering is you're not going to compromise your integrity in order to please someone. However, you're going to do whatever job they give to you to the best of your ability. There's only one type of discourse you can have with that leader, and that's a professional discourse. The minute you begin to get personal, the minute you open yourself up to that leader. And one of the things about a neurotic or a narcissistic leader is they want to know your weakness. And some of the ways they know your weakness is when you get into your personal life and your personal, personal things around you. In that environment, I would keep it very professional, very professional. Everything that I do with that trans, trans, uh, uh, leader, a neurotic leader, would be very transparent. My conversations with that leader would be based on facts. Because the minute you come in and say, I, Matilda, feel this, that's not going to work. But the minute you come in and say, Slovis said this, Abraham Maslow said this, or somebody has said this and has been proven fact, and the scales that were used to say those things have been tested psychometrically, it's going to be very difficult for that person to want to argue. Now, don't get me wrong. They will come with their own argument, but we'll just have a simple disagreement and that will be it. But to get personal with them is where the problem starts. And sometimes what I find is that People go into these relationships with narcissistic leaders with a sense of, let me appease them or appeal to their emotion. And in the process, they compromise themselves. And once they compromise themselves, it becomes very, very, very difficult to now take a stand. And so one of the key ways to handle a narcissistic person is to be transparent from the beginning. Don't get into their condescending blow. The second question on politics. I don't profess to be a politician. I don't profess to know um, a lot about it. I can deal from current affairs. Uh, I wouldn't um, go as far as um, talking about our current leader because it's really none of my business. But I can tell you, um, <laughs> I can tell you one thing. A transformational leader that comes in um, and has been proven to be one would need to do a lot in terms of rolling back all the regulations that have been put in place to destabilize people, to disparage people, to demoralize people, uh, to condescend people, 
uh, they would have to roll those back. In other words, for them to do that, they would have to do an assessment themselves and begin to identify all those who are also transformational while the neurotic leader was in place. And because if you notice, a neurotic leader cannot keep people who are transformational or people who have any form of ethics under them. Uh, it will become, uh, um, there will be friction. It is impossible for you to say that you're a transformational person and you're an ethical person, but yet you get along so well with a neurotic leader. Uh, it, it, I just, I, I'm sorry, may, maybe my limited knowledge. I just cannot see how they can go on for so long because sooner or later, the neurotic leader will show you who they really are. And what you don't want to do is to be at the bottom. <laughs> right. You know, I have, uh, we have like 11 other questions for you that we are not going to get to right now. I would like to move on and we can continue the dialogue in the chat room. Uh, but if you can just like, just for like one or two minutes so that places are generally represented, uh, the countries. Uh, we've taken questions from Canada, from the United States. Uh, I have one from Nigeria, uh, Mr. Fatwa Sheh. He's one of the leading uh, journalists in Nigeria and media consultant. His question is, can a manipulative leader exert the required control in an organization and still leave a motivational legacy? They can, they can exact some control. Control is never a problem for the uh, uh, narcissistic leader. Uh, but uh, a narcissistic leader cannot positively motivate people to do better. They can motivate them to feel their own need and to feel their own purpose and their own goal, but not the well-being of your employees, because when we talk about the human resource perspective deals with the well-being of employees. And so well, the narcissistic leader can run with the fact that we won this and I was able to go into a meeting and get the people going, but when it comes to the interpersonal relationship, between them and others, it becomes a real serious problem. And so I, 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 there's no way to dance around this. Uh, narcissistic leader, neurotic leader, no, they're not good for people. They may be good for the bottom line, but not for people. All right, thank you. So I will leave the other questions for later when we come back uh, to talk uh, together uh, with the two of you, uh, Dr. Skiro and uh, Mustafa. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, Dr. Laura Kiros obtained her bachelor's degree at Skidmore College and her master of social work and PhD degrees at uh, CUNY Hunter School of Social Work. Uh, currently, she's a professor of social work at Adelphi University, where she teaches in the graduate and doctoral programs. Uh, she's also the founder and CEO of LQC, uh, standing for Laura uh, Kiros Consulting. As a consultant, she has worked and continues to do so uh, with a diversity of organizations, including uh, Conica Minolta, uh, the New School, Immunomedics, uh, Administration for Children's Services, PrizewaterhouseCoopers, Sanctuary for Children, Partnership with Children, Staten Island um, Legal Services, Y7 Studio, uh, New York Pilots, and of course, uh, Adelphi University. As an academic, uh, her research interests include the social construction of racial and ethnic identity, a trauma-informed practice through a social justice lens, and diversity inclusion. And um, she has also worked extensively uh, with multiracial groups, uh, I might add that she is biracial herself uh, with uh, a white Jewish mother and a Latino father. And she explores the negotiation of identity within various social uh, contexts. Her goal is always to identify the impact that skin color has on the racial and ethnic identity development of Latinos and subsequently on well being. Uh, the second area of her research focuses on trauma-informed supervision and practice, uh, and she does that through a social justice lens. She's also engaged in research and discussions on and about leadership within academia in an effort to broaden the leadership arena to include the experiences of women of color. In her work as a scholar and a consultant, Dr. Kiros has consistently extended the traditional definitions of trauma and has redefined traditional notions of leadership. In so doing, she has helped many organizations to attain the creation of a workplace 
that is healthier and therefore more productive. Her publications include trauma-informed the trauma-informed supervision core components and the unique dynamics in varied practice contexts. Uh, and also, she wrote the intersection of identities in supervision for trauma-informed practice uh, that looks at the challenges uh, and strategies to deal with that. Uh, her next book, which is currently in process, is titled Incorporating Diversity and Inclusion into Trauma-Informed Social Work. And in that book, she looks at transformational leadership. Uh, Dr. Kiros Yondek. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Matilda. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to lose the thread of the previous conversation. So I'm going to kind of organically fold it into what I'm going to say so we can have a continued dialogue and speak to the needs of our, pan, our participants today. So um, I was listening when Dr. Matilda was speaking and um, I was feeling myself getting very anxious because I want to kind of start by grounding us in the place of where we are in uh, the United States right now. And so we are in a moment um, that I hope will turn into a movement of an intense, intentional, mindful look at how racial trauma is alive and well and continues to be alive and well in every sector of organizations, in communities, in relationships. Um, and it's a very difficult time here. And so as a woman of color, um, as somebody who identifies as a Black Latina and also has a white and Jewish mother, I've navigated the um, world of anti-Semitism and racism my whole life. And so my work has really focused on the intersection of trauma and inclusion um, in looking at trauma, not just personal trauma, but really sociopolitical trauma. And, and in this moment, the trauma of racism. And so for me to start um, without grounding all of us, I know that we have international participants and I wonder what it looks like. I wonder what this country looks like for you right now. I wonder, how you see us. I wonder what you think about in terms of um, the neurotic leadership that has been described, the chaoticness of this country, the pain and the anger and the, the paralysis of leadership right now in many different sectors. Um, and so that's just a rhetorical question for you. Um, but, you know, as a social worker and somebody is, who's grounded in identity and in um, different ways of being, it's important for me to kind of hold that context with you here today. Um, and so the last, just to give you a little background into sort of what I've been doing lately. So as, as Ohiro had mentioned, my, I have a consulting practice that looks at trauma-informed leadership from a diversity, equity, inclusion lens. And what that essentially means is I go into organizations and I work with leadership and I work with leadership around taking an intentional look at how white organizational culture shows up in policy, in practice, in everyday realities in terms of who you eat lunch with, to who speaks up in a meeting, to how policies are laid out, to the collaboration or their lack of. Um, and I work with these leaders, a lot of them white identified leaders, to understand how they've been complicit in systemic racism in their organization, how leaderships, particularly at the executive level, are mostly made up of white men and women, how the diversity lives usually in middle management or at the bottom of frontline staff, and really understanding why this is happening. And so when COVID-19 first hit, um, I was working with a lot of organizations and some of them said to me, you know what, this is not a time to really look at diversity, equity, inclusion. It's a time to fundraise. It's a time to worry about um, marketing, worry about bottom line, worry about um, other things. We're not going to do that diversity inclusion thing right now. Um, but meanwhile, you know, the reality of it is that this was a moment for leadership to really embrace the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, because we saw through research and through anecdotal experience that this pandemic was hitting the black community in a way that it hadn't before, specifically the black community. And if you look at environmental racism and you look at the research behind the concept and action of weathering, and you look at the difference between what we call essential but really expendable workers, all of those were black and brown folks, right? And the 
the weathering meaning, those of you that aren't familiar with that research, but that research being that the, the, the effect of racism, the effect that racism has on your body, your mind, your soul, your psychology over time, and how that alone leads to, um, leads to uh, affect your immune system in different ways. And then also the fact that in this country, a lot of the, um, a lot of folks of color live in in areas that have environment that are environmentally racist, right? There's not a lot of resources. Um, there's air pollution, not healthy food. And so take all those effects together. And what you have is a pandemic that is hitting a community of color in many different ways. But the research and the way that it was, and Dr. Matilda, you know, I'm, I'm really thinking about this idea of neurotic and narcissistic leaders because the way in which leadership in general portrayed that story was from an individual deficit lens. When you read or when you watched sort of everyday news programs, you didn't hear, and the impact of systemic racism is, you heard black and brown people have a higher rate of COVID-19 than other people. And so what that did was it enhanced implicit bias, right? So, you know, I remember running in a park and being yelled at to put on my mask when the white woman next to me was running without a mask and no one said anything to her or the ways in which black and brown people in this country, in this society were sort of um, deemed um, in inferior again because um, the pandemic was hitting them and the the, the word out there was that this was about individual deficiencies and not the fact that this country is founded in, in slavery and that racism is institutionalized here, right, bottom line. Um, and so then fast forward, we see the murder of George Floyd and all of a sudden, my inboxes are full and leaders are struggling, particularly white leaders are struggling with how do I talk about race? How do I deal with this? How do I Bring, how do I take care of black people that I have ignored in my organization as a white person? How do I even begin to talk about this? Um, and you saw a paralysis of leadership. And um, it is sad and it is unfortunate. And right now this country has an opportunity to really step back and look at leadership and understand how important those qualities that Dr. Matilda shared and that I agree with of a transformational leader. You know, when you were talking, Dr. Matilda, about the neurotic and narcissistic leader, one of the things that I was thinking about was the environments that foster that. So before that leader becomes in power, what are the cultures that need those leaders? What are the cultures that are attracting those leaders? And as we see, you know, from this country alone, after President Obama was out of office, this country yearned for that type of leadership because of racism, because of systemic racism and many other reasons. But, you know, I'm very, I'm very, um, I am intentionally thinking about the kind of organizations that have that kind of leadership. And as one of the panelists sort of said, like, what do you do with that? And so, my response to that be, would be to take an, an intentional look at the culture and how that leader was bred in that culture and what is it about that culture. And so this like culture and organizational assessment is incredibly important. Um, the other thing that I want to say, uh, and I was sitting here thinking about is so much of this work and so much about leadership begins with what's your so what's the social construction of leadership so in your various areas that you're calling into and sitting here today how is leadership constructed you know is leadership about egos leadership about status is leadership about um, effectiveness or is or is leadership about serving so I had a small stint in leadership in, at my university as an associate dean and I ended up stepping down because of um, situations of racial and gender discrimination. And although I felt that I could probably fight it, I have two young kids and it was killing my soul. And I felt like at this time in my life, I don't want to take that on right now. I'm not interested in challenging white leadership right now. Um, and so I made a choice to step back from that, to take care of myself and to take care of my family. Um, but, you know, wh what, is, what is happening here right now is, um, it begs the question of how do you define leadership? And what is your purpose for becoming a leader? So we have leaders in the audience, you know, 
this, this moment for me has been an incredibly reflective period with myself, with my organizations, with my students, for them to think about why are you in the positions that you're in? For my students, why did you choose a field of social work? You chose social work. Social work is grounded in a mission of social justice. Are you living up to that mission of social justice? Or are you just thinking about yourself and being in positions of power and, and in unintentionally sort of using people as a space for your own validation, right? Or working with people because there's an idea that you feel you might be better than them or more privileged than them. Or are you actually engaging with the mission of social justice? Um, and some of them don't know. Some of them don't know. And this is an opportunity for the leaders out there to think deeply about why are you a leader? What is it about leadership that you are drawn to? And is it um, a role where you feel that you are using yourself in ways that disrupt the status quo to better serve the people that work with you. So, you know, these are some qualities that Dr. Matilda hit on that I will just expand in terms of falling under the umbrella of what transformational leadership is. And those qualities are, are you honoring curiosity? You know, we spend so much of our time making assumptions. A lot of times we feel like it's easier to just make an assumption rather than to ask a question. If you don't ask a question, you don't know. You can't assume. But we assume we know about people. We assume we know how people work. We assume we know people's narratives. But how often do we ask, right? And how often are we basing our decisions on what the other person said instead of assumptions we make? The other, the other piece of this is, quality that I think about and I, I talk about is nuance and complexity. We live in a society that's very binary, right and wrong, black and white, finding that gray sort of, you know, thinking about theory and sort of postmodernism in this and being able to find the gray and, and being objective or being able to live in a space of ambiguity is very difficult, particularly in a leadership position, right? There's this notion of right or wrong. Um, and with that is this sort of drive towards perfectionism, which innately leaves people out of the conversation. You talk about inclusion when you're driving towards right or wrong or driving towards being perfect or honoring perfectionism, you are most likely moving through processes without including people, making unilateral decisions without collaborating with folks, minimizing people's empowerment in the process, um, and leaving people not as invested as you want them to be so they can be their best selves, right? The other quality that I want to talk about is, is being vulnerable. Um, the, this is something that's incredibly important. How do leaders, particularly in this country, white leaders, model vulnerability, right? Model that they don't have all the answers or the value of teamwork or that things are a challenge to them. Can you model vulnerability? Vulnerability is constructed as a weakness, but it really is a strength. Um, and then the other piece of this is mindfulness, right? That being a leader, takes a level of intentional mindfulness to understand and to operationalize the emotional intelligence that Dr. Matilda talked about, right? You, there, when I am in a leadership position, or even when I'm in a leadership position as a supervisor, supervising people, or in a classroom, my focus is not just on the content of the material. My focus is on every single person sitting in that room. Even on Zoom calls, when I'm in Zoom calls, I am noticing who's shifting in their seat, who's looking away, who gets up to get a drink of water, who is rolling their eyes. Like my intentionality and mindfulness is, it's exhausting, but it also, it, it, it ha it's, if you're not looking literally and figuratively at who your participants are, you're not understanding and you're losing a huge piece of leadership. And the other quality that I just wanna bring to this table is being trauma responsive. And what I mean by that is that you know, in this country, and I can only speak for this country, but being a black or brown person in the predominantly white space is traumatic in and of itself. You don't need a microaggression. You don't need something to happen for that to be traumatic. You're walking into predominantly white spaces as a black or brown person, and you immediately either put on an armor, right, a psychological armor, 
or you retreat into your own space and you know very well that the chance of you being able to bring your whole self into an organization that doesn't look like you is next to impossible unless that it is explicitly stated, right? So now organizations are beginning to have conversations about how white leaders for a long time lived in a state of denial about this racial trauma because they didn't need to be aware of it. Everyone else looks like them, right? The organizational culture, definitions of success, definitions of qualified are all based on white ideology. The leadership literature in this country is mostly written by white men, right? So that's what students are learning unless people are taking an explicit critical race lens to that. So how can my, my sort of, um, challenge right now both as a leader and also as a participant in and under leadership is how do we create these environments that are transparent how do we create these environments where there's empathetic accountability where we can hold each other accountable even where we can hold leaders accountable when they mess up when they forget to say something when they um you know sort of implicitly act in a way that is in terms of their unearned advantage and not from a place of humanity and kindness and recognition of other people that look and have different lived experiences from them. So um, I would like us, if it's okay, Ohiro, for to kind of combine our talks and, and have the audience sort of speak to what we were both saying, because I think we're saying very similar things and really understanding sort of the bottom line, and please Dr. Matilda correct me, but just how, how toxic and unhealthy um, this idea of a narcissistic and neurotic leader can be, and even more that sort of what cultures, um, what, what cultures nurture that? Why do those cultures nurture that? And where can you as a leader kind of step back and take a reflective personal vulnerable look at how you are complicit in narcissistic or neurotic leadership and how you can be more of a transformational leader, right? Because that's really the goal is how can you be personally and professionally transformational so that you actually can nurture these environments that are kind, that are humane, that are compassionate, that are accountable, and that are equitable and inclusive. So I'm going to stop there, um, if that's okay. And, and hand it back to you, my friend. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, the thought was going, was actually to combine the discussion uh, in the end. But even if I, well, we're not going to do that, I think that the participants have done that for us. Um, and for some reason, these Canadians are very, very active. Uh, I have a question uh, from Canada that says, uh, for Dr. Laura, uh, the, the racist situation that you paint is pathetic. And I mean that in a, in a positive sense. Uh, history shows that it has always been the other. Is it nature or nature? Whatever the source, do you know of a situation where any set of privileged people see their implicit advantage for no gain? You said a question? Yeah, I'm thinking about it. Um, I'd like, you know, I want that unpacked a little. Can, can, can the participant unpack that a little bit more? Right, so we can go on while I try to get him to, I know exactly who it is, so I'm going to pull him up. Uh, let's see. Okay, now he can talk. Uh, can I? Yeah, that's now. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me. Okay. Yeah, I'll just say uh, my question is who gives up, you know, um, an inherited or implicit uh, advantage? You know, the perpetrators, if you like, in quotes of racism, um, probably inherited that from some investment made in the past. It, it did not come naturally. Someone invested, you know, and the advantages that those people enjoy today, you know, uh, you know came from that investment. Now, 
we want them to trade those privileges or the investments or the, uh, the dividends of such investments, you know, because you feel like they should share the advantages with you. So this is the point that I'm making. You know, when we talk about racism in any society, um, and that, you know, it can take the form of racism in America, it can take the form of um, some other, you know, um, negative tendencies in other regions, even within, say, African societies. You know, you also have the same thing playing out. So my point is, you know, if people have inherited, if people have inherited uh, some advantages from what their forebears did, you know, why would they trade that? Why would they give up that power for nothing? What do they benefit, you know, from inclusiveness? Because you are basically asking them to trade some powers that they have or share that power, you know, with everybody. Uh, my question is, why would you want to do that, you know, for no benefit? Uh, before you answer that, can I say that there is actually another question that uh, really sort of dovetails. Uh, it says, how do you approach, so you answer both together, it says, how do you approach leadership when, you know, uh, or try to convince them that focusing on racism and discrimination is important to their bottom line? So, so my, my, my answer to that, and it's not an answer, it's more of a, a discussion to that, is that I, I mean, I, one, because I want to go back, I want to start with the second one and then move forward. My approach is never to convince anyone, right? I think this is, I think this is an opportunity for us as a country to look at what unearned advantage is. And then it becomes a choice. In order for this country to move forward, there's going to have to be a sharing of power. And for me, that the benefit of a sharing of power is a society that's kinder, that's more humane, that's more inclusive. Do I believe that America in general has those traits? It's not innate to this country at all. Can it be learned? Probably. Will it take years if it continues on this way? Because remember, what's happening right now is just a moment. It hasn't turned into a movement yet, right? There have been many times before in this country where there have been uprisings and there have been protests and people have said that they were gonna change their ways. And this is, feels a little different, but we don't have much evidence in this country to think that this moment is going to turn into a movement. So my work with leadership is not about convincing them. It's helping them understand, again, going back to this social construction of leadership and why they are leading and what the goal is for them as organizational leaders, working with their executive team and helping them understand that leading with an iron fist or not sharing power in the space of collaboration is traumatic for the organization. So I think, again, this is all a choice. Like I don't, and it all happens through relationship building because my work with leaders go back, you know, to childhood experiences and to how and why they became leaders and what their investment in leadership is. And if that investment falls in the lines of lack of validation as a child or um, this, this need to kind of own people and produce and it does it's not it's not based on sort of relationship building and moving forward the leader is not going to the leader is not going to change and we have evidence of that there's a lot of leaders who move forward um and they look at diversity equity inclusion as a space of, of performative work right so as that these are just about increasing the the numbers of people of color and not actually the behaviors of the organization so, um, so that's kind of, I mean, I think this is a discussion to have because my, I would sort of throw it back to the panelists and say, well, you tell me, right? Like what, what would be the advantage of sharing under and privilege? Like why would somebody do that um, as leaders of, of organizations? Um, and that's a personal choice. And I'm not so sure that leaders um, 
I don't, I'm not so sure that leaders will take that path, but I know they won't be as successful if they don't take that path. Oh, Hero, did you want to, you put something in the chat. Did you want to say oh, something? Oh, that was uh, for someone else because I would like uh, Dr. Vats. Uh, he's with us from Delhi, India. Uh, I'd like to see if he's ready. I was just going to him to ask him if he would like to share with us uh, his view of leadership from uh, the Indian cultural context. And he's a man who really does a lot of work in using language to interpret culture. Uh, so I just wanted to see, you know, if he would want to be engaged in that conversation. But while he thinks about it, uh, I have a question for you. And uh, the, it speaks, I think, to something that you talked about, uh, Dr. Kuras, when you talked about how do we hold leaders accountable? Uh, so this question says that it appears that your, your resignation, uh, facing all of those circumstances, uh, there is a way that some might see it as, you know, you stepping away then helps people to continue to perpetuate injustice. And so he's saying, could that be that you did not, there was no correlation of support behind you? In other words, had you that amount of support that was needed to be able to hold leaders accountable, would your job has been, have been easier, even within the context of the circumstances that you are facing? You froze before and you just came back, so I didn't hear. Okay, so my understanding of the question is, if you had the support that you needed from other people, besides the leadership, would that have made your job easier? Would it have been easier then to hold leaders accountable? Yes, it would have been because I think when you're in an organizational culture where there is not, where accountability isn't normalized, um, you become the odd one out, right? And so if you don't have that support and you're the one that's holding accountable, you become the one that you become, the, there's a negative, um, you, you become the one that's sort of the troublemaker, right? Or the one that's always bringing things up and other people are complicit in their silence, right? Being silent is being complicit. So we know that. So if I'm the only one, if I, if I had support in that way of holding leadership accountable, and I did end up holding leadership accountable before I, I, I stepped down from that leadership position, um, it would have been easier, but that. But back to Dr. Matilda's point, the culture wasn't such where there was any accountability or empathetic accountability. So there was no room for that to grow in an organization because the seed, those seeds were never planted. So people didn't know how to do that. It's in my personality in, innately to do that. I have my my integrity around social work and leadership is incredibly strong, but. It, in that, it's a losing battle. Right, so Dr. Uh, Mustafa, do you have any contribution to this conversation about the support and how you approach leadership and how you try to change it? You are muted, you know. Okay, <laughs> now we know. Um, this is there's a little story um, that I want to tell, and this is uh, embedded in the Chinese history, and it was the Dan dynasty. And what the kings and the leaders would do is, whenever they came into place, they killed everybody that they found there uh, before them. They killed all their enemies, and that was one of the ways that uh, the um, the dynasty kept on rolling over and rolling over. And every time, I mean, the turnover was very high. And then the Song Dynasty came in, and when the Song Dynasty came in, this is what uh, the leader did. Uh, the leader noticed that uh, all the predecessors have just wiped their enemies out. So the leader did two things. The first thing the leader did was to uh, pay the, send the generals out on early retirement. So the first thing he did, some of the generals. And then the others that were real arch enemies, he found a way to work with them. And the Song Dynasty in the Chinese history lasted 100 years. I say that to make a point. 
In our learning, I find that, again, because of the characteristics of the narcissistic leader, the impulsive behavior, the repulsive behavior, the abrasive behavior, one of the things you don't want to do to challenge a narcissistic leader is not to show that you have something in common with them with those derogatory um, characteristics. And so one must be very, very skillful in again, not only just being perceptive, but also learning how people behave. And so when you're dealing with a narcissistic leader, for example, if you're forced to have to deal with them, and we've talk, I've talked about being transparent, and um, Dr. Laura mentioned about transparency as well in the workplace. One of the things that I found to be effective, because whether we see a, a neurotic leader, narcissistic leader, we found we've met leaderships who may not have the five characteristics that the um, uh, American um, a psychiatric association has determined as narcissistic. They may not have all five, but they may have some. And so one way or the other, we run into them, we'd have to deal with them. What I find to be the most effective way to deal with them is not just transparency and identify yourself for who you are, but knowing how to work with your enemy. The enemy cannot know that you recognize the fact that they are your enemy. The enemy cannot get this belief. They're, they're going to know it, but they cannot hear it from you that you are better than them or you know how to do the work better than them. And so once the narcissistic leader, remember that they are so wanting to be accepted and so wanting to be tapped on the back and encouraged like you've done a good job. Once you can find their weakness, and I'm not saying pandering to bad behavior, but whenever they do something that is contrary and out of their character, you must recognize that. So while you're recognizing positive behavior that they exhibit, trust me, you would discern them little by little. Now, don't get me wrong. Some are destined, they're like a masterpiece destined for destruction. So it doesn't matter what you do with them, but we cannot negate the fact that sometimes or most oftentimes love and kindness kills. It will disarm even the most evil person. And so now, like Dr. Laura said, sometimes you feel like I don't want to go through the fight. I don't want to go through it because it takes a lot. And so a lot of us don't want to have to go through all that thinking and processing and situational analysis to try to figure out how to handle that. But there are people who are stuck in those positions. And so I want to touch on one other subject. Um, someone mentioned, um, why would someone want to give up their power? Nobody wants to give up their power. But what I believe that minorities and, and groups that have been disparaged, what they're looking for is, and I've said this, and I've said this even in conversations, give me the freedom to perform. Let us have an equal playing field to perform. I'm not asking you to give me favors. I'm not asking you for you to uh, pat me in the back and tell me I did a great job. Just give me the opportunity to perform. And so while no one is saying, oh, you know, we want power, we're saying create an opportunity and let the best man win. You've been in power for a very long time. You know the tricks, but just allow me an opportunity to show you what I'm made of. And that's how I see that because really and truly no one wants to give up their power. Nobody does. And we will be delusional to think that somebody is going to let their, let their power go so that you can come and rise above them. And lo and behold, they don't know what you're capable of doing when you, be, when you get in charge. And so that's that fear. And that fear must be recognized. It must be recognized because it's a threat. So how do you handle that? If you handle that with abrasiveness and assertiveness, and we have to do it right now, we have to get it right now. Trust me, there is no man more... Uh, 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 enjoy, I, I, I don't even find, know the word I'm looking for. There's no man more excited about the fact that you are crying for a power that they hold so dearly in their hands that not even they themselves believe that God can take it from them. So you must come with a whole nother technique. I'm not sure what that is. I'll let the masters answer that. But I know something has to give and it's the strategy that matters. There's gotta be a strategy. Right, so it will be some sort of a lightning round uh, right now. I 
I have two questions first uh, that I'd like to go to, and then I'd like to go to Dr. Lavat in, uh, in India, and then I'd like to go to Uche Naduru, who I, I know is the um, communications director, I believe, for ECOWAS, that's the Economic Committee of West African States. So she travels the entire region. I'm not sure where, what country she's at right now because as she sees different kinds of leadership even across um, Africa. So I'd like to go to her uh, to speak to us about what she sees. Uh, but the two questions for you, Dr. Laura, the first one is, uh, when protests end, legislative reforms are passed, uh, organizations often tend to revert back to normal courts. So the question is, how do we continue to have discussions about racism? Um, so that's a question that keeps me up at night because that is something that I fear. Um, that once the fires die, this conversation will die. And I think that it, it comes up, and I'm going to go back to the word strategy because Dr. Matilda, you made me think of all the strategies I've employed to keep this conversation going. And so what I've done is I've developed in, as a participant and as a leader, sort of cohorts of people that I can go to that have more, that are listened to better than I am. So in the university, for example, I have some white colleagues and they are listened to better than I am. So if somebody comes mm -hmm. up or if somebody says something in a meeting, I will text them and I will say, say this, right? This, that person shouldn't have said that or that person is not fair. If I say it, people are going to probably say, there she goes again, talking about race and racism and injustice. If you say it, they're going to listen to you, mm -hmm. right? So I use my white colleagues and my colleagues who um, know and believe in this work to continue these conversations because I know that I sound like a broken record at times. And so um, in order to keep the conversations alive, to answer your question directly, one, leadership has to be committed to it and keep it on every single agenda, every single full staff meeting. Even if there's nothing to report, it stays on the agenda, right? And how are we looking at our systems and our policies and procedures so we're not complicit in systemic racism? And then the second piece of it is gathering your people, right, who you strategize with to make sure, you know, an email just went out last week and somebody said something and it, it wasn't it, somebody brought up that the issue right now is on anti-blackness in this country but somebody brought up class and so a few of us uh people of color had reactions to that but we knew we couldn't be the one to respond to that because we always say that so a white colleague of ours responded to this and said what we would say but it was listened to differently so there are also this, there's strategy there has to be strategy so though that's an answer to, to to your question and um i think leaders sitting here on this on this panel today have a responsibility at least in this country to keep that conversation alive and to look in explicitly at how policies and procedures in your organization live in a space of white white organization culture and uh, racial trauma uh, right. Another question for you, Laura. It, it, it says, um, um, thanks for great insight into the current state of affairs in America. Uh, the question is, do you think that our allies thoroughly understand the pain of being a person of color? In my case, being a black man in America. Yeah. Because, okay. <laughs> No, because I don't think that people of color have been given the opportunity to share their pain. And I don't think white folks have the stamina to listen to the pain. And so again, there's been this state of denial and um, there's been a state of denial um, and guilt and shame. And so those lived experiences haven't been shared. Right. I have just launched a poll, and I'm sure that you all are seeing the poll now, and if you will please just answer that, uh, and then I'll let you see the results later. And then uh, the, uh, the next uh, question that uh, I have actually says, um, how do you manage, because we keep talking about the leaders, and the question is, how do you manage a neurotic employee? 
Question for who? From either of you. It was meant for you, but either of you can handle it. How do you manage a neurotic um, uh, follower? And this is where the leader who understand situational leadership uh, skills come in. And what situational leadership is, uh, and again, we've talked about this before, that the transformational leader is often viewed as a situational leader because they have a, a, a accurate situational analysis of what's going on. And so they know when to be autocratic, bureaucratic, transactional, and transformational. And so, yes, you can have a neurotic follower. And a neurotic follower can be one who is so self-absorbed that they do not share knowledge with their um, colleagues. And one of the things that I find will be useful in an environment will be to create facilitators. And what are facilitators? Facilitators are not managers, but they facilitate teams. And so you want to put them in a situation whereby they begin to learn how to work in teams. And so in order for you to convert the neurotic, um, the narcissist or the neurotic employee into one who's more willing and more committed uh, and more sharing, you would have to put them in an environment of such. So everyone comes in with their own, uh, with their expertise. And usually when teams are formed, in the formation of teams, you have people coming in with different skill levels. So your team must be well thought of as the leader in order for you to have the narcissist within the team. And whatever you do within the, whatever happens within the team has to be monitored and evaluated. And what that means is that every action within the team has to be monitored. The narcissist would have no choice then to begin to contribute to the team effort, because once they understand that this team effort is for the good of all, not just for the good of one, and then they understand that a behavior as such as a narcissistic behavior would not, would not prosper or cannot be allowed to foster in that environment, more likely than not, they themselves will begin to shift their learning. And so this is where a leader who is, um, uh, a leader who's transformational and situational comes in, the emerging leadership. So you're not just managing people, but you're man managing processes and you're managing styles as well. Right. So, uh, Ms. Uche Duro, um, can you hear me? I think I have the right person. Uche. Uche Ngozi. All right. She's not there. All right, Dr. Vats, can you hear me? Hello. Right. Hello, I can hear you. Good evening, okay. everyone. Yes, uh, it is night in India right now. I think it's about 10 p.m. Yeah, it's five, uh, five minutes to 10 now. Right, so here is what we want to hear from you. Uh, the culture in India is different from uh, the one that we are used to in this part of the world. Uh, so my question to you is based on all of the conversations that we've been having, how do you see the role of culture uh, in the expression of leadership in India? Uh, in fact, uh, India is a multi-ethnic country. You will find people of so many kinds, people of so many colors, people of so many looks, people of so many languages, uh, you can hardly count even how many languages we speak in India. We have uh, so many major religions and all religions are almost major in their own way. So uh, culturally, it's very difficult, in fact, to find a leader who can satisfy all kinds of identities. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very difficult. Right now, say, uh, Narendra Modi is the prime minister. Is supposed to be a leader of masses, but thing is, again, there are identities which is find it very difficult to accept him. Uh, similarly, I mean, it, it is the case with almost all the leaders. But what I personally feel is a leader is the one who, who tries to keep the discourse, the social discourse or political discourse power neutral. When actually, uh, you know, there are so many power equations. And moreover, when the power equations are, are, are hugely unbalanced, then the problem starts. 
when a, when some groups or a particular group start gaining more power dominance or some kind of uh, i mean narcissistic attitude you know that uh, i am better mine is better then the problem happens and this is the problem all over the world uh, in, including america india or you go to any country mm -hmm. right so the thing is the mass leader i mean the person who who is able to somehow keep the discourse contained uh, you know uh, within the reaches of balance is the is a good leader but uh, the the thing is it's very it's very difficult uh, sometimes for one person to maintain all the positions it's important that the advisors and the other people those who are there in the senate they they are equally sane then only things can improve thank you oh thank you very much go yeah, ahead can i say can i say something just really quick cuz i think to that point um dr vats is that this that being able to do that requires um an incredible sense of mindfulness and in, an incredible sense of higher order purpose right because it requires somebody to engage with the masses as you say from not an objective standpoint because i don't believe in objectivity but from a subject from their own positionality and social location but knowing that that is just their positionality and social location and they're not trying to um convince or to um lead from that space it's really it, to me it just feels like such a um a, a practice it, it feels like a practice and it feels like a higher order purpose to something that's so much bigger and and so much in the area of service than anything else to be able to sit back and to be able to hold space for so many identities it's really an outer body experience and that's why i believe that the training of leadership has to be grounded in in mindfulness and intentionality and an intense look at how unconsciously we may be bringing our own beliefs and and self onto other people and not really serving the masses because to me that is revolutionary love right that's gandhi that's malcolm x that's um che Guevara, that's paulo fieri you know that's the leaders that serve and have a higher order purpose and i don't see that anymore and that's what makes me deeply sad you know i think uh, if i uh, if i'm allowed to uh, uh, make a point a quick point please the uh, thing is that uh, it is sometimes very unreasonable to put all the expectations from leader in fact what about the other people whom the leader is supposed to lead you know uh, it is like uh, you know how a theater happens like in india there is a concept if in fact uh, in india uh, uh, as per uh, our own ancient uh, aesthetics literary aesthetics there is a concept that a person who writes a play i mean the writer is not everything or the person who is performing on the stage is not everything it is the participation of the audience who is there actually for whom there is a beautiful term in india we call it sahriday i mean people who have the uh, the like mindedness and who have uh, the similar heart that this is the term sahriday for similar people with similar heart who are the audience and when there is they work in unison then actually the things happen in 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 perfect way or at least in most desirable way so uh, i think i find it uh, really uh, unfair actually uh, whatever whoever is the, the leader is if we keep all the expectations from leaders what about the expectations from the other people who are who are there you know to work with the leader i mean i i have this perspective you know, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vats. I don't want to leave without us answering this question, even though I know that we must go. Uh, just a one minute, just one minute. It, it says in, post, in a post-COVID-19 environment, it is envisaged that we are going to have more distributed workforce and remote working. We also have the march towards more technology de deployment, including our you know, AI and robots. 
the future is looking very different. Will the leadership character, narcissistic or neurotic or transformational really matter as we move forward? Yes, it would. Um, I once did a paper on virtual team and leadership. And, um, and so we'll, at that time, we were looking at uh, virtual teams in terms of international and dealing with people and time zone. And one of the things that we found was that uh, it becomes, it's difficult already while we're on ground, but just imagine now online. So yes, it does matter. The leader now has to do more work than they've ever done before to get the workers to buy into the vision, to get the workers to work efficiently, effectively. They're already losing part of themselves because now a lot of people are saying they're working 12, 13 hours. So the leader now has a very, a, a very important role in ensuring that these workers get the satisfaction from those hygiene factors as well. So just because I'm home and working from home doesn't mean that you shouldn't develop professional development programs or have, have me involved in strategic plans because there is a tendency for people to see everyone on the internet as abstract. But I think it's, very, it's more important now than ever that to understand that a narcissistic leader, a neurotic leader will not be effective at this point because they, they may think now that they can hide behind the scene. But what I like about this is that what I like about everyone being on the computer on the internet is you really get to really see the discipline in everybody. You get to really see if while we were on ground, if you had created an environment where people were autonomous, people were independent, and they, they weren't codependent on the leader. And so this is where it really begins to show. So maybe the exposure of some of those narcissistic leaders will begin to emerge. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are going to end, but we just had our first contribution from the United Kingdom. Uh, and it's not a question, it's just a statement that this is very exciting, this discussion, and that the, she believes that the point where we should start is to begin to understand who we are and be mindful, which is the thing that uh, our panelists have spoken about. I'm really grateful that you all decided to uh, take this time and donate this time to uh, the, the production and discussion of knowledge and self-awareness uh, because the idea is really to help make all of us a better world by creating better organizations and making ourselves better people too. I thank you all who have joined us from all over the world and uh, my special gratitude uh, goes to Dr. Kiros and uh, also Dr. Isaac Mustafa. I thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again and uh, seeing everyone because we are going to continue to have these conversations. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Same here. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.